Material Advantage, which is an organization for materials engineers. We're here to talk to you a little bit about what materials engineering is and show you some really cool demonstrations that relate to materials engineering. So in materials science, there are three main categories of materials that we're going to talk about today. The first is polymers, the second is metals, and the third is ceramics. So I am Rebecca, I'm a sophomore in materials engineering, and I study polymers. Uh, and I'm Charles, I'm also a sophomore in materials engineering, and I'm uh, specializing in metals. So the first demo we're going to show you today is having to do with polymers. Cool. All right, so right here, I have a racquetball, nice and squishy. It's made out of polymers, which are, they're known for being ductile, flexible, like everything a racquetball is. But the thing about polymers is that they're really temperature sensitive. So in like comparison to metals or ceramics, a little bit of a change in temperature changes a big chunk of the material's properties. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pour my favorite liquid nitrogen <laughs> into a cup with the racquetball, and we're gonna see how it changes the properties of the racquetball. This spoon. Spoon's right there. Amazing. All right, so we're just gonna go ahead and set it in the liquid nitrogen and let it sit there for a minute to get nice and cold. So what I'm gonna do when I take this out is I'm gonna throw it at the ground pretty much as hard as I can. And we're gonna see what happens to it. Oh boy. Do more liquid nitrogen? Yeah, do a little bit more. How do we think that is? Oh yeah. Nice and cold. Alrighty. Here it's all coming go. together. Oh no. <laughs> Sometimes this one doesn't work on the first try, so we're gonna add some more liquid nitrogen to it. There is a chandelier. And if throwing it doesn't work, we'll end up smashing it with the hammer. The hammer is the backup plan. <laughs> All right, super cold. Let's try this again. Whoa. Well right. Okay, so if you couldn't see that, it exploded. Because like I said, um, but polymers are really sensitive to temperature, so we got it cold with liquid nitrogen, and that changed it from being a flexible, bouncy polymer to behaving like glass, because it underwent something called its glass transition temperature, which is a really important temperature point for polymers. So as you see, the pieces are still nice, hard, and brittle, but as they heat up back to room temperature, it'll regain its flexible properties and be like a stereotypical polymer. That's exciting. Next one up, we got a CD. Uh, you know, everybody, all the tunes today are on the CDs. These kids making their mixtapes for their friends on the CDs. Uh, we like to destroy them here. Uh, CDs are also made out of polymers, uh, and they're what's called cross-link polymers. So imagine you have like a plate of spaghetti, right? Uh, and all these spaghettis are like all on their own, just kind of doing their own thing. But imagine if like the spaghetti grew hands and like started to like grab the other spaghetti friends and created like these chains in between the spaghettis. Uh, and so that's kind of what's happening with these cross-linked polymers is these polymers have reached out chemically and they're bonded with other chains of polymers. Uh, and so when they work together, they're able to do so much more than they can apart. That's why the importance of friendship, this is what what we're really telling you about today. Uh, but when we put a little bit of oil onto the CD, uh, we're like putting the oil on the hands of the spaghettis. So no longer can these spaghetti friends uh, hold each other tight, but instead their, their hands are going to slip 
apart. And so it will eventually break. It's already beginning to fracture a little bit near the, near the front. We'll see how quickly it breaks. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Uh, but when we put a little bit of tension uh, on this CD, there's a little bit of force along with this oil, it'll make these uh, polymer chains slip and the CD will break apart because it can no longer work together with all of its other polymer friends. I want to show you another importance of crosslink polymers and how working together uh, is more important than going apart. Uh, while that CD stays over there, we have two balls, the happy ball and the sad ball. Um, they're pretty identical. I don't really know which one's which, uh, but one of them is going to bounce and one of them is not. I don't know if it's this one or this one, left or right. Um, but the reason why one bounces and one doesn't is because of the friendship. The left one was the sad ball and the right one was the happy ball, my left. Um, but the reason why this one doesn't bounce and is sad is because it's like a clump of rubber bands. It just falls down to the table and nothing happens. Whereas this one is like a rubber band ball. It bounces because together the rubber bands are able to do more than they are apart. When the rubber bands work together, they're able to provide a force so that when it bounces, ah, there's the CD, it breaks in half because the crosslink polymers are now these rubber bands. But when this rubber band ball hits the table, all the polymers are able to work together to make it to bounce back up. Whereas with just the rubber bands by themselves, they just fall to the table and don't do anything. Same thing happens with the CD. When the polymers are able to work together, they're able to be much stronger than they are apart. And so the CD is able to stay together when, they, when they're able to hold hands. But when they slip, when the hands slip and they're all on their own, then unfortunately the CD will break. As you've seen, that one was pretty exciting actually. So we've talked to you guys a little bit about polymers, but sadly it's time to move on to the next category. I know polymers are super exciting. We're going to talk about metals now. So I'm just going to go ahead and preface and let you know that I have known for being insanely strong. So here I have a steel rod, and I'm just going <laughs> to willy-nilly bend that steel rod into a U-shape like so. I'm going to do it again with this same rod. I know, I'm so strong, it's amazing. <laughs> and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat treat them both by a process called tempering. So what I'm going to do, this is a blowtorch, very exciting. We love fire and ice here. So I'm going to go ahead and hold the steel rod in the fire to let it get all nice hot. The atoms inside the steel are going to get super excited with all the heat and they're going to be moving around pretty fast. And then I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and freeze them by dipping them in water, which is called quenching. And what it's going to do is these, these atoms are basically playing freeze tag with all the heat. They're running around. They're excited. And then we're going to play freeze as soon as we dip them in the water. So we're going to go ahead and start with that. So once again, what we did is we got these atoms super hot, super excited, and then dunked them in cold water, and now they're frozen in place. So basically, they're running around playing freeze tag. You say freeze, they're like this. They're kind of unstable. I could push Charles over right now, but I'm feeling nice today for some reason. <laughs> All right, so with one of these steel rods, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it back in the heat for just a little bit. It's a process called annealing, which is just getting a little bit more time, giving a couple more seconds for the atom to get back into its stable position because it's just heating up a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and do that. All right, and then I just quenched it again by sticking it in the cold water. So now Charles and I are going to try to break these steel rods. Wait, trade me. <laughs> OK, ready? No, no. Oh. He can't break his. So, like I said, I may be super strong, but that's not the reason why this one broke and this one didn't. This is the one where we just heated it up super hot and then froze it. So those are the atoms that are all unstable playing freeze tag. And Charles had the one where the atoms were able to take an extra second and get nice and steady and comfortable. So that made their bonds a lot stronger and harder to break. So it wasn't Charles being weak and me being strong, sadly. 
it was the steel being stronger. <laughs> Alrighty, next up with metals, what do we have? We have something called shape memory alloys. This is exciting. Do you work with these ones? Go ahead. So we got some shape memory alloys. These are magic, magic metals that just remember things. They have a brain. They don't. They don't. Um, I like to do fake science here. Uh, these shape memory alloys are able to remember what position they were in when they were originally made. And so, no matter how much I bend it and make it into a squiggly shape like a snake, or you know, I could make any sort of thing, but I'm not really that creative or cool, if you want to do that one. This shape memory alloy starts out as this, this squiggly thing, but when we provide a little bit of energy in the form of this boiling hot water, and a little bit of time, the shape memory alloy will go back to its original position. And same with this second one. So the reason why this works is because these alloys, when they're originally formed, are, are in this nice low energetic state. They're nice and stable. But when we provide energy and we, we work on them and we twist them into these fun shapes, they don't like to be in that position. That's higher energy for them. And they want to get back to that nice, calm energy state. So what happens is when we provide a little bit of energy in the form of this hot water, they're able to snap back to that original state and be nice and calm again. And these shape memory alloys, uh, for some of you guys out there who may or may not have braces, um, are used in the braces because the heat of your mouth is able to take that, that metal. And it's able to slowly move your teeth back into you know, the, the nice teeth shape. Uh, and so that metal was originally cast into that teeth shape so that when you put them on and that heat of your, uh, heat of your mouth is able to slowly cast them back into that original shape because they have that, that memory of where they want to be in that nice, calm, low energetic state. Alrighty, our next metals demonstration for you, I present a magnet and a plastic tube. Very exciting, not magnetic. Now we're going to see how fast Charles is right now. I'm going to go ahead and drop this magnet from the top of the tube and see if he can catch it off the bottom. You ready? Ah. He missed, if you couldn't see. You want to know a try? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is the one. This is the one. Okay, ready? No, oh, almost close, caught close, it. Close. We'll make it a little bit easier for you. All right, this one, this is a copper tube, also not magnetic. It's very important. All right, ready? Oh, that was too easy. He caught it, but that's because it moved a lot slower. I'll show you one more time. Oh, too yeah, much time. kind of make it a little bit easier for him. So even though this tube is not magnetic, our magnet is. So what our magnet is doing is it has a magnetic field around it that is moving through this tube. And since the tube is metal, it generates electrical currents moving through the uh, tube that are called eddy currents. They're little tiny currents. And those make their own magnetic field. So when this is moving near it, it, it becomes magnetic because this becomes magnetic when a magnetic field is moving through it. They're called eddy currents. We're a big fan of fire uh, here, so any, any excuse to bring back the blowtorch is a good one. Actually, we'll start, we'll, we'll explain without the blowtorch. This is just, you know, a nice strip of metal. Uh, on one side, it's slightly different color. Uh, that'll be a hint as to what's coming next. This is actually two different metals uh, on either side of the strip. And when we heat it up, we'll hopefully see that it does something fun. It's nice and straight right now, but we'll see what happens when we put it under the fire. So when we heat it up, it curves over to one side. And let's see what happens when we cool it off again. Ooh. It's back to that straight position. So the reason why this happens is these two different metals heat up at different rates. It's different coefficients of thermal expansion is what they're called. So one of them wants to heat up, uh, once, one of them wants to expand more and take up more space when, they're, uh, when it's hotter. And one of them doesn't want to do that quite as much. And so that metal, when it wants to expand, it'll expand faster than the other metal, and so it'll make it curve over to one side. And that's uh, different thermal properties of metal, so when we heat them up, they'll do different things. And another example of this is with pennies. Uh, some of you may or may not know that pennies are not completely made out of copper anymore. Uh, what it is, is it's a copper shell with a zinc interior. You want to do this? Yeah. All right, so we have our copper-coated zinc penny right now. This is a 24. 2018 penny. Nice, pretty new. So I'm going to try my best to let you see this one. I'm just going to 
Hit it with a blowtorch, because again, we love fire here. All right, and then I just quenched it real quick. Let's see if this one worked. Okay, it still works a little bit. It's kind of hard to see. So what happened is the zinc inside the penny has a lot lower melting point than the copper on the outside. So when we heat it up, the zinc kind of liquefies inside the penny and the copper stays pretty solid. And then we quench it and the zinc kind of shoots out and re-solidifies because it got cold again. So that's because the two materials have different melting points. So it makes a funky shape with our penny. And it also, we get some brass showing on the penny because there's something called diffusion which is when two, like, one species of molecule moves into another species. And with, if anyone knows what brass is made out of, it is zinc and copper. So when we heat it up, it speeds up the diffusion and you get a little brass golden section on the side because the zinc moved into the copper and they mix together to make a brass alloy. So this is another example of those different thermal properties of metals. And speaking of thermal properties, although we just hit this with the uh, blowtorch, I'm not gonna touch this side because that's way too hot. But this other side, you know, it's kind of warm, but it's not too, not too hot, surprisingly, despite the fact that it was just at hundreds of degrees and it was enough to melt this penny, right? It's still okay for me to use as a human, just putting my hand on there. Um, and this is because of the next property, the next group of materials, which is ceramics. So ceramics have very low thermal conductivity amongst some other things. Uh, and so what this is actually from is it's a space, it's a tile used on, um, lunar and other uh, space uh, craft because what happens is when these spacecraft are entering the atmosphere of like Mars, for example, with the, the new Mars rover that just landed or you know coming back to Earth, it's gonna hit a lot of air molecules as it's coming in and it gets really hot and it, uh, it actually like starts fires on the, on the outside. Um, and so what needs to happen is all that, that heat needs to be pushed away from the, from the craft so that the humans or the the technology inside can stay safe. And so even though it's just got hit with that blowtorch, my hand is still okay on the other side. And so that's one of the great uses of ceramics. Right. A common ceramic that you'll see um, all the time is in this jar right here, um, it's sand. It's not very exciting. <laughs> it's silicon and oxygen that makes sand, which is what we have here. But if any of you um, play Minecraft, you know what happens when you heat up sand? You get glass, which is an amorphous ceramic material. Oh, I'm doing this. So. Okay, okay. So we have this glass rod, right? And so if we heat up this glass rod, it won't melt because glass doesn't actually melt. But what happens is it gets very viscous, which means that with this extra heat, it kind of becomes like a liquid, but not quite because glass never does. Can you turn it off in a second? Or, yeah. Yeah. So we have this glass when it heats up, it goes through different points, so like a working point. So here I was able to make this fun shape. See how well I can quench it without breaking it. You want to break it. Uh, it broke. So this glass rod, we were able to work it into this weird shape. But even so, when we put a flashlight to it, it's kind of hard to see. You might be able to see that it lights up and at the other end, it'll still be bright despite the fact that it makes this turn. And so these glass rods are what's used to bring the internet to your homes. So when you have light that runs through this, this glass rod, uh, it has total internal refraction, which means that no matter what happens, the light will keep bouncing within this glass, even if it takes this turn or you know, it goes to Des Moines or it you know, takes a left and goes to Chicago or whatever it does. Uh, it's still able to bounce around and take uh, that information uh, and give you the internet. And so that's a great use of glass. The shoes. Yeah. I know everybody was looking at the shoes and how cool they were. Everybody wants these shoes. How cool are you on the playground if you have light-up shoes? That's, that's the best. But what makes these shoes work is once again ceramics, the beauty of ceramics. So what, what's inside of this shoe, when you take it apart, you destroy it like this, you'll find these, these LEDs on the end, but what really makes this all work is this little thing in the middle. So what it's called is, it's called a piezoelectric. Uh, so what happens is this ceramic is able to somehow give us electricity. Uh, and so what that, the way that this works is you have little small cells, it's like little Lego bricks. Uh, and these little Lego bricks of ceramics 
have a small positive charge on one side and a small negative charge on the other side. And that's really not enough to do anything with just one Lego brick. But if you build that up and you create this really, really gigantic Lego brick out of all these Lego bricks, then now you have this really big positive charge on the top and this really big negative charge on the other side. So when I hit this, this piezoelectric, what happens is that charge goes through the circuit. Uh, instead of being on the top and the bottom, it goes through the circuit and it completes the circuit. It lights up the LEDs, makes you look super cool on the playground because everybody wants light up shoes. I want light up shoes for my age. Unfortunately, they don't make them. Um, but it completes the circuit. This charge runs through uh, and that's because with that little hit, we're able to force the electron through the circuit and create the, uh, the lights. And these piezoelectrics are also used uh, on a grill. So if you ever start a grill or you hear that starting, it goes click, 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 click. And that's a little bitty hammer hitting a piezoelectric. And when it hits that, it'll create a spark. And that spark will jump across a gap and there'll be gas that flows through. And that'll create the fire because that piezoelectric, when it's hit, when you hit that with the mechanical force, it'll cause that electricity to fly through. Um, the last one, right? Yep. Alrighty, so ceramics are known for being hard and brittle. So you drop your mom's vase, it breaks. You drop a clay pot, it breaks. You drop a brick, it splits in half. That's because these are really brittle materials. However, we still have buildings made out of bricks, and why would we want to build something out of something that's brittle and is going to break? The good thing about ceramics is that when you put them under compression, you put them with vertical force pushing down on them, they're a lot stronger because the cracks can't move any farther and cause the material to fail. So this is why brick buildings are fine because all the force or all the, it's a vertical building that's putting compression on the bricks and making them stronger. So that's something to note about ceramics is that they are stronger in compression. Now we have a material over here that is called tempered glass. So it's basically just like our other amorphous glass, except when it's all nice and heated up and viscous, they cool it a little bit differently. They cool the outside super fast. So all the outside molecules are just frozen in their place. And then the inside, cools down a little bit, actually a lot bit more slowly. But these, these molecules don't have as much room to move around, so they end up pushing against the outside. So all the things in the middle, they're in tension. They're trying to get out of the glass, but the outside of the glass is pushing in. The whole surface area of the glass is pushing in on the inside, which is causing there to be compression coherent in the material, which makes it a lot stronger. Strong enough where I'm willing to stand on this piece of glass for you, and I trust it. And not trip over. Can you help up? No, no, I got okay. this. Okay, we don't have the extra chair today. All right. So as you can see, I'm standing on this piece of glass, kind of bouncing around a little bit, and it doesn't break, not even cracking, which I'm very glad about. So however, it's strong when it's in these compression forces. But like I said, the compressive forces are only on the outside. So if something happens where the compressive forces part gets broken into, you go just a crack that's a little bit too deep, you break off a little corner, all those molecules that are in tension explode out because they finally have freedom, which is what we're going to show you next. It's basically a disappearing act. So what Charles is going to do is he's just going to clip a little corner of this glass. We're going to see how that affects it. Ever so carefully. Right. I'm ready. Okay. See? Nice. So they can see the outline. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's a strong piece of glass. It doesn't want to go. So is. as you can see, it shattered. Yeah. This strong piece of tempered glass that was holding up, or strong enough to hold me couldn't withstand just a little bit of a break on the outside. So that happened because once again, we broke through the compressive forces on the outside. So all the molecules that were in tension were just able to escape, get out, and cause the glass to shatter. So you'll see these in car windshields. Um, a lot of big buildings, <laughs> skyscrapers often have a lot of tempered glass because you want to look outside 
but you still need a nice strong building material that you can be able to put you know, layers and layers and a lot of floors up. Yes, so hopefully you enjoyed viewing our polymers, metals, and ceramics demonstrations. Materials are literally everywhere around you. Anything you have requires material science to figure out how to make it the way it is and make it better. Material science is all about taking materials that already exist and making them stronger, better, making new materials. Um, Being a materials engineer, you get to play around and have fun with all these things, but you're also learning about the science of why does that glass work like that? And if that glass works like that, how can we use it properly? And if we want the glass to behave differently, what would we need to do? So you have other types of glasses that you put polymers in, and the polymers and the ceramics work together, and you kind of get the best of both worlds. And these are uh, able to be used in different uh, uses. So it's a materials engineer's job to create new materials, to work with the ones that we have, why did they fail that way, uh, and do everything, because materials are everywhere, uh, and so materials engineering is the best.